In this place, tradition said there once stood the most famous and the most tragic city in the world, the city of Troy. For 3,000 years, travelers have come here searching for truth behind the tale. And out of it, every generation has made a new version in its own image. But as we enter the final stage of our search, can the archaeology of Troy be squared with the legend? Troy was a real place. It stood on a hill now called Hisalik, near the Dardanelles in what is today Turkey. So far in our search, we have found that the Trojan War may indeed have happened, that this city may have been sacked towards 1250 BC in a clash between two of the great powers of the day, the Hittites and the Mycenaean Greeks. Soon afterwards, both empires fell apart and sank into a so-called Dark Age. In the Aegean world, once important places like Troy became the haunt of squatters. But it is only by looking at this wider historical picture, the aftermath of the Age of Heroes, that we can hope to pin down the archaeology of Troy itself. Was the place remembered by legend, the city of fine walls found by Wilhelm Derpfeldt, which fell towards 1250 BC? Or was it, as is still generally believed today, the city of shanties excavated by Karl Blagen, built on the ruins of Derpfeldt city? According to archaeologists, the time gap between them could be as little as 10 years, or as much as 80. But as we know from our own time, a world can change in 80 years, the period, say, from the Boer War to the Falklands. What happened when the Greek heroic age ended? And did mysterious newcomers to our tale, the Sea Peoples, play a role in a historical sack of Troy? Homer says that after the Trojan War, the victorious great king Agamemnon returned home to disaster. The legends said he was assassinated here by his wife, Clytemnestra, murdered in his bath to be replaced as king by a rival kinsman. Agamemnon was perhaps buried in one of the great beehive tombs, known as treasuries, surrounded by the loot of Asia. But the heroic age of Mycenae was interred with him, a 
According to tradition, no other king from his city claimed the great kingship of Greece. The archaeology of Mycenae could support the idea that the heroes of Troy came back to a time of growing troubles. By 1200 BC, the city seems to have declined rapidly. An air of defensiveness can be seen in the last building project undertaken by the rulers of the city. This is a flight of 54 steps. They go down about 40 feet below the level of the last platform. Again, if I don't fall over, this is a Mycenaean corbel vault covered with a thick layer of some kind of plaster, at two or three inches thick. I can feel the damp seeping through there. Now, why it was covered with plaster, we'll see just down here. It's a water system. This is siege technology, such as is found all over the Near East at this time. It's to ensure the water supply during a long siege. The sackers of Troy were now themselves beset. No longer secure, even from their nearest neighbors. Mycenaean Greece had never been a unified country. It was a collection of independent city-states. Mycenae, Nestor's Pylos, Sparta, the kingdom of Menelaus and Helen, or Komenos, Thebes, the city of Oedipus, Iolkos, the home of Jason and the Argonauts. At times, some of them may have combined in a loose confederation under the most powerful, but now their fragile unity broke apart. This is the plain of Kopais, near Orkomenos in central Greece. It was once a huge lake. In the 13th century BC, in the greatest engineering achievement of the Mycenaean age, massive dikes were built to drain the lake, creating the biggest single source of grain for the dangerously booming population of late Bronze Age Greece. This is one of the retaining walls of one of the dikes. A three yard thick cyclopean wall. 20 yards of fill, another cyclopean wall, and then a 60 yard channel of water. And 30 miles of channels. This enabled the people of Orkomenos to control the seasonal flow of the rivers which came into the lake and to cultivate perhaps 25 or 30 square miles of land which had been lake. The drainage installations here were protected by a string of forts centering on the immense fortress of Glar. Here, the harvest was collected for distribution behind a mile of Cyclopean walls. These great buildings were erected by the king of Orkomenos. Along with Mycenae, Orkomenos was the only city described by Homer as rich in gold. According to the Iliad, its king had been an ally of Agamemnon at Troy. Now, Bardic tradition says that Orkomenos fell out with her powerful neighbor, Thebes. The war that followed was a catastrophic blow for central Greece, for the dikes were smashed and the plain flooded. Komenos itself was sacked and burned. Yeah. 
worse was to follow. For if the legends are right, the war now drew in the city-states of the Peloponnese. They did not know it yet, but the kings of heroic Greece were on the brink of a dark age. Isthmus of Corinth, so often the front line in Greek history, a long wall was hastily thrown up, anticipating attack from central Greece, perhaps from Thebes. Thebes rivaled Mycenae in its material wealth and in its legendary saga of tragedy and bloodshed. Here the ill-fated Oedipus had solved the riddle of the Sphinx and married his mother after killing his father, Laius. Now Thebes too was attacked and burned by forces from the Peloponnese in an expedition remembered in the epic tale of the Seven against Thebes. And now, in the cellars of Thebes, the walls of the Mycenaean palace itself have begun to emerge. Seen by modern eyes for the first time since they were levelled by the Achaeans after the plundering of the palace and the enslavement of its women. This taboo place lay covered by a thick layer of debris in which, astonishingly, the treasures of the palace of Oedipus lay untouched. With them, we come face to face with the sack of a city in Mycenaean times. The storeroom contents spilled out as a Troy. Jewelry of agate, jasper and amethyst. Gold adornments which had once bedecked the women of Thebes. A hoard of precious cylinder seals from Babylon made in the coveted blue stone lapis lazuli. And the ivory legs from a throne panoply carved in the shape of bound papyrus stalks, perhaps from the throne of Oedipus himself, incinerated by the blaze. But even so thorough a destruction was not enough for the conquerors, for it seems that a curse was placed upon the ruins. A much later traveller, the classical writer Pausanias, says that even in his day, the area of the palace itself was in some way viewed as holy ground, not to be built on or trodden on. And extraordinary as it may seem, when archaeologists first started to dig in Thebes in modern times, in the early years of this century, in Pindar Street, right above us, and when they first found the remains of the palace of Cadmus, they discovered that they had not been built on for over a thousand years after the sack of Thebes. Archaeological finds strongly suggest that Orchomenos, Gla and Thebes were destroyed towards 1220 BC. But other evidence, the Linear B clay tablets found at Pylos, suggest that at this very moment other parts of Greece were threatened by attack from outside. Thus, 
The watchers are guarding the coasts. Command of Malius at Owitono. 50 men to go to Icalia. Command of Nedwatas. 20 men of Kiparisia at Aruwoti. Rowers to go to Pleuron. The Pylos tablets seem to speak of preparations. Troops are being moved, strategic sites garrisoned, lookouts posted. The home guard is on standby. Bronze is being requisitioned just as we commandeered aluminium for our Spitfires in the Second World War. Pylos had no fortifications. The kings here had lived in their painted palace, confident in their military might. But now they were on their own. The palace was burned down, the king's treasures looted, the women and children enslaved. The fate of Troy was now handed out to Pylos. The last act of its king was to order sacrifices, perhaps human. Perform the rituals at the shrine of Zeus and bring the gifts. To Zeus, one gold bowl, one man. To Hera, one gold bowl, one woman. The tablet on which this was written trails away to a scrawl as if the writer was butchered at his writing bench. Pylos was never again lived in by men or women. It's a dramatic tale, if we've read it right. But with such fragmentary and ambiguous evidence, the only certainty as yet is that the palace was destroyed. In fact, the Mycenaean Greek world was going through a complex decline. Overpopulation, local natural disasters, agricultural failure, even the over-exploitation of the workers may all have played their part. But one by one, the great palaces, most of whom Homer says went to Troy, vanish now like blips off a radar screen. Orchomenos burned. Thebes burned and abandoned. Pylos burned and abandoned forever. The Menelaean at Sparta, gone forever. Iolkos burned. But there was no one cause, and not all went under. Mycenae continued to exist, although shattered by an earthquake in around 1200 BC. But the biggest surprise is at Tiryns. For now, perhaps, Homer's Tiryns of the Great Walls overtook Mycenae as the most populous and powerful city-state in the Argolid. The German dig at Tiryns, which is going on at this moment, has shown that after 1200 BC, Tiryns grew in size. A substantial walled lower town, now being excavated, was filled with buildings. Outside the citadel walls, a huge shanty area with a grid of streets received a great influx of new people. Apparently refugees settled on a permanent basis, swelling Tiryns' population by many thousands. Tiryns was only finally abandoned, along with Mycenae, a little after 1100 BC. Its people the first Mycenaeans ever seen by modern eyes on Schliemann's frescoes, 
were among the last to disappear. So the end of the heroic age came not with a bang, but a whimper. Tradition said that three generations after the Trojan War, Greece was entered by waves of Greek-speaking newcomers called Dorians, perhaps peasants who lived on the fringes of the sophisticated world of the palaces. By 1100 BC, the glory had gone. The last palaces, like Mycenae, were abandoned. Their bureaucracies vanished, and with them, literacy itself. It would be oral tradition alone over the succeeding 400 years which would carry down to Homer. Dim traditions maintained by the illiterate successors of the Mycenaeans of the wars of Troy and Thebes which had destroyed that godlike race of heroes. But it was not only the Mycenaean world which was sinking around 1200 BC. The crisis, in fact, affected the whole Bronze Age culture of the Eastern Mediterranean. In Anatolia, too, at their capital, Boazkoi, the Hittites were increasingly nervous. Hittite diplomats had watched the disintegration of the Greek body politic they have no record of a Greek great king after about 1230 BC. The last appearance of his name is crossed out before the clay was dry. By then, the Hittites had troubles of their own. The Emperor Hattushilish III had died in 1235. His son, Tudhaliash, already middle-aged, was left to hold the empire together and keep all his subject kings loyal. He still proudly called himself King of the World, but he was faced with attacks and desertions on all sides. He responded by constructing huge defences, whose footings can still be seen today. Sixty feet high city walls with massive towers, a last ditch barrier against the barbarians. Poor old Tudhaliash, the last of the really great kings of the empire and architect of the final magnificent phase here at Hattushash. Tudhaliash died about 1210 BC. His sons followed him, Anuvandash and Supiluliumash, optimistically named after the great kings of the past. But they're mere shadows to us. They're the last Hittite kings of which we have any record, and their reigns were short. Perhaps we can see the way the wind was blowing in the last phase of the architecture here at Hattushash, for in Tudhaliash's day, it, these immense fortifications were completed, enclosing a square mile of city. Inside the city, also, a string of forts were erected on the crags across that natural amphitheatre, standing over it like grim sentinels. And as at Mycenae, great effort was made to secure the water supply by tunnelling secret passages deep under the city. Their world was threatened then. But whether that threat came from external enemies or from their own people living in the hills about them, we don't yet know.
the last tablets from the Hittite archive give no hint of trouble. But out on the fringes of the Hittite empire, panic-stricken messages were flying back and forth, speaking of a state of emergency remarkably like that at Pylos. Enemy ships have come. Some of my towns have been burned. They have done evil things. My fleet is away. Seven ships have appeared offshore. Now if there are more, please tell me and of what kind. Write to me. I must have warning. Boazkoi was burned down in around 1180 BC. The Hittite Empire fell as completely as any in history. But who were these mysterious raiders from the sea? Egypt. Thebes of a hundred gates, the oldest and most stable power in the Near East. The Egyptians knew the Greeks and the Hittites. Egyptian ambassadors had gone from here to visit Mycenae. The Egyptians kept detailed historical records throughout this period. Records written not merely on clay tablets, but on papyrus and on the walls of their great temples. And they give us first-hand evidence of a shattering series of events around 1200 BC, which seem to have convulsed the world of the Eastern Mediterranean. The foreign peoples made a conspiracy in their islands. All at once they were on the move, scattered in war. No one country could stand before their arms. Azawa, Cyprus, Carchemish, the Hittites, all were cut off. And on the contemporary Harris Papyrus in the British Museum, we learn the strange names of these invaders. The Danuna from the islands, the Chekeru, the Pulisati, the Sherden, the Weshesh of the Sea. The Egyptians have also left us images of these enemies who so frightened them, the faces of the peoples of the sea. Egyptologist Ken Kitchen at the University of Liverpool believes the Egyptian accounts of the Sea People's attacks of 1210 and 1180 BC are first-hand diplomatic evidence for the crisis. Diplomacy didn't stop just because we don't have the documents. Diplomacy would go on, ordinary humdrum way, exchange of presents, yawn, exchange of envoy from so-and-so. It's all the ordinary way of life at the court of St. James today. It's the same in the court of Egypt of Ramesses then. And diplomacy would go on until the network was cut by the invading hordes. Uh, when Hatti fell, when the capital went in flames, if that's what happened, the diplomats from other countries would flee to save their skins. The Egyptian diplomats would be on their way home. They wouldn't stay there to be roasted alive. And the message would come fast. So it would be hot. like fleeing the embassy compound in Saigon, would it? Yes, it would be like people fleeing in modern conflicts, whether it's from, you know, events in Western Asia or the Near East or anywhere else. Uh, or Central America. If a regime's in trouble, the country's breaking up, the foreign diplomats will naturally get out if there's nowhere for them to stay and be safe. And the message will come home, literally and metaphorically, uh, to the home country. This state has gone, this state's in trouble. You can expect no more relations with Hatti or Azawa. And the Egyptian authorities, the pharaoh, will be on the key vive, ready to see if anything would threaten Egypt. The Egyptians were able to repel the Sea Peoples and settled many of their captives as mercenaries. But it is still not known where they originated, only that they appeared to come from the coasts of the Aegean and Anatolia over the Great Green Sea. Who were the Sea Peoples? Nancy Sanders has made a special study. 
these events happened in such and such an order. It looks as though perhaps Sea Peoples were engaged, but that's supposing that the Sea Peoples came from outside. But the Sea Peoples may have been the Mycenaeans themselves to some extent. Ah. Oh. So that um, by the time they get to Egypt, you're dealing with possibly displaced Mycenaeans or Mycenaeans out on the make. Can I pick you up on this intriguing idea that the Mycenaean Greeks may well have been among the Sea Peoples? What would be our evidence for that? It's partly a question of what happens after the breakdown of a, a social structure, and there's plenty of evidence the social structure did break down, partly through over-specialization, farming techniques and so on. And what happens to a fighting aristocracy? And one of the things they do is take to their boats and go, go out as corsairs. So rather like the Vikings, the sons of kings may have gone off to try and carve kingdoms in quite, other places? Quite possible, but you're never going to get evidence for this. There is evidence, however, that Mycenaeans migrated all over the Mediterranean at this time. So there's nothing unlikely in the idea that the Sea Peoples did include migrant Greeks and even discharged and displaced war veterans, men like Odysseus of Ithaca, whose ten-year wanderings are recounted in Homer's Odyssey. We came to the fair-flowing Nile, and in the river we moored our curved ship, and then we set about devastating the fair fields of the people of Egypt, and then their people came out at dawn, and the plain was filled with soldiers, and with chariots and flashing bronze, and they killed many of us with their sharp bronze, and others they led back to their city alive to work for them as forced labor. So, ironically enough, tiles from the Egyptian palaces could show us the true faces of Homer's sackers of cities. But the Sea Peoples would then appear to be only a symptom, not the cause of the dissolution of the Bronze Age Aegean world. Colin Renfrew, Professor of Archaeology at Cambridge. I'm not very impressed by the level of discussion and argument in this field. And I think there's been a simplistic approach where people have been looking for one simple argument. They said we had a great dark age, we had the end of the Aegean world around, uh, well, between 1200 and 1100 BC. Terrible things happened. So were there plagues, were there dramatic misfortunes? And I think one has to look for a slightly more sophisticated explanation, which we're quite used to in our own world when we've had uh, economic recessions and disasters, and they don't ri arise from a single cause usually, they arise from a complexity of causes, uh, and I think one can look for a slightly more complex explanation, it may not be quite so graphic with sort of sheets of fire from the sky or something, but maybe a little more realistic. And I think it's quite clear that many early state societies, if you want to call them that, many early civilizations were in fact rather unstable. And they, many of them had population growth, they over-specialized, and then when they came into some adversity, as it were, they, it was quite easy for them to collapse. And I think it's useful to recognize a general phenomenon, what I like to call systems collapse. And if we establish this as something that really happens quite often, we don't need some very special, mysterious explanation, some weird waders from the, invaders from the north or some strange uh, sea peoples or something like this. Uh, we can actually look for more rational explanations, more akin to the explanations we use in our own time when we're talking about the, the recession in the 20s, something like that. Or, or the... Uh the Arab oil crisis in the 70s. But, That's uh, right. Uh, in that case, you might first of all say that the recent world recession is the result of the Arab decision to increase the price of oil, which produced the oil crisis. But if we ask, why did the Arabs decide to increase the price of oil, and why did they decide to do so then, you find yourself in quite an elaborate analysis again, and I think the truth is that events of this kind do require quite careful analysis, and they're not to be explained away by one mysterious horde of invaders. So let us try to draw the evidence together. 
Until about 1250 BC, the Greek and Hittite empires were still in their heyday. Then the power of both rapidly declined, and a political vacuum was created in western Anatolia, the region of Troy. Those parts sank into turmoil, obscurity and confusion, later remembered as the onset of a dark age. Just before 1200 BC, famine struck western Anatolia and precipitated mass migration. Many of the sea peoples were probably migrants from those parts. There, as in the aftermath of the modern struggle in Southeast Asia, the old states and kingdoms were swept away. By this time, the fragile influences of the Greeks and the Hittites on western Anatolia had all but vanished. Can the Trojan War story be fitted into this picture? Did it take place in the heyday of the empires or in the black hole left by their collapse? The evidence from the Hittite archives and Homer suggests strongly that it was a real war and that it took place before 1250 BC, when the Hittites still had alliances in western Anatolia, which the Greek great king was trying to undermine. Then, Troy was a rich city with wide contacts. Fifty years later, by 1200 BC, it was too late. Greek contacts with the area had all but ceased, and many of their own palaces had burned down. But can the archaeology give us a more precise date? We must turn again to the ravaged hill of Hissalik. The mound we call Troy was inhabited for 5,000 years. In that time it accumulated 50 layers making up nine main cities. It was sacked at least nine times by hostile armies. So in one sense what we're looking for is nothing extraordinary in the violent cross-section of human history, which is Hisalik. But we're looking for the fall of Homer's Troy, and that comes down to just two levels separated by less than a century. The Trojan War has to be at one of two settlements on Hisalik. It's either Troy Savene, Carl Blagan's city of shanties, uh, a city which had certainly suffered a siege, storage jars in the houses, uh, uh, the shanties in the streets, and then the devastation, the firestorm, the unburied bodies in the streets, but a city that bore only a passing resemblance to the city described in Homer's epic, the Iliad. Or it has to be Wilhelm Derpfeldt's Troy VI, a city which in every way, as we've seen, resembled Homer's Troy in the Iliad, with its wide streets, its fine walls and towers, but a city which, if Carl Blagan is right, was destroyed by earthquake. It has to be one of those two, and it has to be within those few years. The exact dating depends on finds of imported Greek pottery, whose style can now be roughly dated by the experts. Most of the Greek pottery at Troy is what is known as LH3A and 3B. It shows that Derpfeldt's city of the fine walls fell towards 1250 BC. But our search centers on the Greek pottery called LH3C, which was introduced after 1200 BC. If any 3C was found by Carl Blagan in his city, Troy 7A, then it must have fallen after most of the palaces in Greece. Istanbul. Here the search proper began all those months ago on the trail of Heinrich Schliemann. All archaeology is an act of destruction, an experiment that can only be done once, for once the finds are taken out of the ground, their context is lost. 
From then on, we rely on how archaeologists interpret their finds. But inevitably, science moves on. Blagan's finds are stored in the former Imperial Museum in Istanbul. With hindsight, was he right about the date of the pottery by which he interpreted the fall of his Troy, 7A? Or was he too seduced into making his finds fit the legend? Back home, the last available pieces of the jigsaw puzzle were soon in my hands. The next step was to seek an expert opinion on the style of Blegan's pottery sherds from Troy. Dr. Elizabeth French of Manchester University. Well, that one's an old friend. I've held forth about it before. Um, it's fairly crucial because of this um, spiral here next to the handle. That's a feature that is particularly common in Late Atlantic 3C. Um, and this Blegan didn't pick up at the point. If you look at some of these pieces, a piece like that, where you've got another handle and the little tiny spiral next to it as a fill. That is actually a later piece, but it shows the same characteristic of which this would be an early example. Very distinctive. Very it? distinctive. Mm. And to my knowledge, it doesn't happen earlier. Mm. And so I have always thought that this shirt, unless it's an intrusion from above... Now, of course, this is the terrible business with sherds in debris levels, mm. is that it's very difficult to guarantee that they are pure, that there are you will always have things thrown up from lower down as they disturb levels. The site is constantly down, being churned over. Yes, yeah. they make mud bricks, yeah. they, they yeah. dig into wall yeah. foundations, things of this sort. Yeah. But also, particularly in Turkey, you have um, gerbils. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say earthquakes, <laughs> but gerbils. gerbils are yes. is. <laughs> they make very large holes, perfectly yeah. good shared-sized holes. Um, and it is perfectly possible for stuff from upper layers to, to get further down. And so you can never be totally sure. Is this enough to make you suspect that Blagan's Troy 7A actually fell too late for the, the Trojan War? Well, it depends when you're putting the Trojan War. I'm putting it when the Mycenaean world is still in its some sort of heyday and palaces like Pylos are still standing. Well, Pylos may have gone, but don't forget that the 3C period is the, a very prosperous one now at Tiryns. The new evidence from Tiryns shows that Tiryns, in fact, has its greatest extent at this period. And, well, I almost suspect, in fact, that Tiryns is the base for the Sea Peoples. You won't buy that one? Ah. So, so Mycenaean raiders could still have sacked this city only in the 12th century? They could, yeah. if they're being raiders. I mm. myself don't actually see them as raiders. Mm. I see them more as entrepreneurs, buccaneers, possibly raiding in, in certain places, but more like Drake's lot in the, in the West Indies, um, being bad if they had to, being good in other places. And we have a growing amount of evidence that there were settlers in the islands of the Aegean at this period. And this is where Troy, in fact, is a dropout. Troy doesn't seem to have settlers at this point, when the other islands and other places do. And it would be for this reason that I would think that Troy had already been sacked. It had been so heavily pasted that it yes. couldn't recover. Well, that it didn't have contacts with the Mycenaean mm. world mm. by this point. But maybe I need to look at the, uh, the sack of Troy VI, the fall of Troy VI, which Blagan thought was an earthquake. Does that strike you as a worthwhile line of inquiry? Indeed. But uh, how do you identify earthquakes in the archaeological record? Well, you're an archaeologist. How do you? Well, Can you tell the difference? I don't, I don't know. I'm not at all happy about an earthquake in many places. The reason at Mycenae that they've postulated it is that they have dead bodies caught by falling masonry. This is the supposition. I don't recall that there is any of this at Troy. A 
A dozen pieces of LH3C were found in Blagan's city of shanties, enough to cast serious doubt on his dating. His Troy must have fallen well into the period of decline, towards 1180 BC, after the destruction of Pylos and Sparta. So unless we wish to reduce Homer's story to an inglorious foray by Mycenaean pirates from Tyrins, we're left with Derpfeld's city of the fine walls as the only candidate for Homer's story. Troy VI, the city Blagan alleged fell to an earthquake. But was it an earthquake? How do you distinguish an earthquake from a man-made destruction in the archaeological record? I went to Cambridge to ask a man who looks at Anatolian earthquakes as his job, Dr. James Jackson of Queen's College. There's, there's Blagan's earthquake damage, the mm -hmm. piles of rubble. And underneath, now there's Carl Blagan's rubble from his deliberate destruction of the, the shanty city. Yes, they don't look a lot different, do they? Yes, I must say, I, I don't know how you tell them. It's hard enough to tell the difference between buildings that have been demolished after an earthquake when they want to do, start the clearing up operation. You come along even a month or two later where demolition has started and trying to tell the difference between what had actually fallen down the earthquake and what had been demolished, which is very important for some sort of work, if you want to see how the building's performed. Mm. That is actually a problem sometimes. Mm. They may have some definitive observation which, which, which uh, decides it, I mm. don't know. They don't. They don't. Blagan's definitive observation, as far as I can tell, was that he wants one of them to be the siege of Troy that Homer tells of, and therefore the other one has to be... Uh, ma ha it, there's no other reason for well, it. You know, the, it's perfectly reasonable that Troy uh, has in its time felt big earthquakes somewhere nearby, but mm. how you prove that this particular case was one, I don't know. So there was never any real proof for Blagan's assertion that the fine walls of Troy VI were felled by an earthquake. The tradition in Homer was that they were toppled by the hand of man, by Agamemnon's army. Was Homer right after all? There was only one question left. Did any of the excavators of Hisselik, Schliemann, Derpfeldt, Blagan find any hard evidence that the earthquake city was actually sacked? Of course, I admit I was only doing what others had done before me, trying to make the facts fit the legend. But surprisingly, Schliemann records a number of Mycenaean weapons which he found in the sixth city. Axes and barbed arrowheads, like those found by Derpfeldt and Blagan, in the destruction level of Troy VI. Unwittingly, of course, for Schliemann thought them much later than the Mycenaean era, he couldn't explain why he found a Mycenaean lance head and four axe heads identical to those he found at Mycenae. Easy to let imagination get out of hand, after all, the Trojans could have bought these from Greek arms dealers. But how do you explain the great fire which Derpfeldt traced all over the city? Even Blagan had to agree there was no doubt Troy VI was thoroughly burned. Could those tumbled walls not have been deliberately demolished on that burning, baleful night? Right down the ages, it was the tradition that at the end, Troy's towers were deliberately thrown down by the vengeful Greeks in a scene imagined by every generation of poets and artists for over 3,000 years.
dirt-felt city then would be Homer's Troy after all, the Troy of the Trojan War. The pottery suggested fell not long before 1250 BC, and that fits the Hittite story of a crisis in western Anatolia, when the Hittites clashed with the Greeks over a city called Willusa. Perhaps it was then that Troy was sacked and leveled by the great king of Greece. Afterwards, within decades, an era of instability began with famine, migrations and sea raiding. For the survivors on Hisalik, life was a constant threat. Blegan's shanty city, Troy 7A, lived through all that to be finally devastated by sea raiders around 1180 BC, 80 years or so after the Trojan War. Such ideas agree so well with Homer. But of course, in the end, they too are only speculation. And I, perhaps, like all those who examined the question before me, have only found what I wanted to find. That has always been the attraction of the search, for there can never be a final word on history's greatest riddle. Only the perceptions of each generation which reinterprets Homer's tale in the light of its own beliefs and its own needs. I expect by now you're thinking that the Trojan War has as many possible conclusions as those novels they write these days where they give you alternative endings to suit every taste. And in a way it's true, as we've seen throughout this, that archaeology tells us almost as much as about ourselves and how we want to see ourselves as about those lost civilizations. But as we draw to an end of the search, it's only fair that I put my neck on the block and say what I think happened, for what it's worth, with as few ifs and buts as possible. So here goes. In the Bronze Age, on the shores of the Dardanelles, there was a city. Perhaps it was called Troy. In its heyday, it was the most beautiful city in the Aegean world, with fine walls, elegant mansions, and surely a marvellous palace on the top of the hill. It was ruled by a vigorous and able royal family, and confident and wealthy, it went its own way for 500 years, safe behind its walls. In the last days of its heyday, after the year 1300 BC, its towers were built, and this, without any reasonable doubt, is the city reflected in the poems of Homer, the Greek poet who composed the story of Troy 500 years on. He tells of a city of wide streets, fine walls, a horse-breeding city, a royal citadel. This city, Troy VI, fell around 1250, to an earthquake, the excavators said. But I don't think that their evidence can tell us whether this city was not leveled deliberately, its walls pushed over by attackers. And in any case, how can archaeology distinguish between an earthquake and the sack of a city if they both came together at the same time? Just look at what happened afterwards. The place was rebuilt, but in a very jerry-built way, packed with shanties, dismal tenements, a soup kitchen. Something worse had happened to Troy VI than a mere earthquake. What it looks like is that the royal family had been exterminated. Troy VI had been sacked. The chief candidates, the chief suspects, surely, are the Mycenaeans, those sackers of cities, seizers of treasure and women, who followed up their trading throughout the Aegean world with aggression. And it is the Greek legend that the Mycenaeans did indeed sack Troy. That story, the tale of Agamemnon's expedition to Troy, as we've seen, goes back to the Bronze Age. Elements in it must have been sung by Mycenaean bards before the fall of their world. And that, I suppose, means that I think the Trojan War did happen which I didn't think when I set out on this search. As for the sequel, the poor successor city, Troy 7A, eked out its existence for a few decades, and then around the year 1180 was sacked by the Sea Peoples. Its shanties burned, 
and the bodies left unburied in the streets. A sad end to the story. Tying up the loose ends, did Agamemnon really exist? I don't see any reason why not. Uh, why shouldn't the bards have preserved the pedigrees of the last great kings of Mycenae? So maybe Agamemnon did indeed ride through this gate and up this street of Troy as a conqueror. What about Achilles and Hector? Well, their names are Bronze Age names, but I suspect their roles in the story are the inventions of that wonderful poet. And what about the wooden horse? Well, classical writers thought the story so absurd, they rationalised it as a siege engine, one of those great covered wooden battering rams which held many men to sack a city. But if it was an earthquake that gave the Greeks the key to Troy, is it not possible that in gratitude they left an idol in the image of the earthquake god Poseidon, a wooden horse? And I almost forgot... What about Helen of Troy herself, history's golden girl, the face that launched a thousand ships? Did she really exist? Well, in the archaeological record, love leaves no trace.